George. Yes, Madam President, I move to appoint Julie Guillory to the position of attendance officer. Second. second. We have a motion by Mr. George and a second by Mrs. James. Do we have discussion? Hearing none, please vote by raising your hands. Aye. Motion passes. Opportunity to vote. <laughs> okay, Mr. Burdine. Yes, Madam President. I move to approve the resignation and release agreement between Fort Bend ISD and Christina Carson, certified employee. Second. Second. We have a motion by, motion by Mr. Burdine and a second by Mrs. James. Do we have discussion? Hearing none, please vote by raising your hands. Motion passes. Mrs. James. I move that the board issue a school district teaching permit for CTE, culinary arts and hospitality and tourism to Kelly Hubert. Second. We have a motion by Mrs. James and a second by Mr. Rice. Do we have discussion? Hearing none, please vote by raising your hands. Motion passes. Moving on. Oh, I have two more. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> That's Mrs. Okay. James. I move that the board issue a school district teaching permit for CTE criminal justice to Fabia Mendez. Second. We have a motion by Mrs. James and a second by Mr. Rice. Do we have discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Motion passes. Mrs. James. Mrs. Tossan, I move that the board issue a school district teaching permit for CTE criminal justice to Cassandra Reynolds. Second. We have a motion by Mrs. James and a second by Mr. Rice. Do we have discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Motion passes. Now we're moving on to our review items. Item 6A, we have several proposed 2007-2014 bond program construction projects. Number one is our upgraded electrical service at Willow Ridge High School and McAuliffe Middle School and blanket easement. Dr. Dupree. Yes, um, our executive director of design and construction, Oscar Perez, is gonna actually discuss each of these items um, kind of um, in the aggregate. So that would be everything under item A, one, two, three, four, and five. He's also prepared to discuss with the board kind of the, the contingency status of the bond program because you asked about that at a previous meeting and he wanted to kind of share that in the context of this discussion as well. Now if we're done playing musical chairs. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Dupree. The first item that we have is uh, the Willow Ridge High School and the McAuliffe Middle School blank the um, overhead project. So we're, what we're seeking here is we're seeking a construction service agreement with Cypher and Son LTD in the amount of one million seventy six and forty four, and a construction service agreement with Centerpoint Energy in the amount of one hundred fifty four thousand nine hundred fifty four. Project budget totaling one million four hundred thirty one thousand eight hundred and forty and budget amendment totaling eight hundred and seventeen thousand three hundred and seven seventy seven for the electric service upgrade at Willow Ridge High School and McCullough Middle School campuses and authorization for the superintendent of schools to negotiate and execute the contracts as described below. And additionally, staff recommends consideration and possible approval of a blanket easement with Centerpoint Energy to complete the work. In summary, what we're looking at doing here is that Willow Ridge High School and McCullough Middle School are two campuses that Fort Bend ISD at this point owns the primary service. And the primary service is the actual electric service that feeds the campus. Uh, the primary service is the, the overhead wiring, the, the poles coming to the uh, transformers, which then 
becomes secondary, steps it down, and brings it on to the campus. And in the past, this was a way that uh, service was provided, but with new standards, it is customary for uh, Center Point Energy to be the one that owns that primary service. And so what we're wanting to do here is we're wanting to go ahead and relinquish our ownership. This is old service that could fail at any time and go ahead and, and allow Center Point to come in and provide service to these two campuses. Uh, the, um, the installation uh, and eventual removal will also not only replace the overhead, but it will replace the transformers, uh, step down transformers at McCulloch, but not at Willow Ridge. Uh, you may recall, and it's been probably a little over a year when there was a failure there, an item was brought to the board and the, the secondary generators were, were replaced. So we're not replacing those, we're keeping that, but uh, we are replacing all of the primary that's uh, coming to these two schools. In addition, we also are, have an alternate for a temporary generator at McCulloch because when we're doing this switchover, we're, we're coming in and uh, we're gonna put in a temporary line that then over spring break of uh, 17, we'll go ahead and shut down and we'll switch from the, the primary that we have right now to the temporary so that then we can demo the existing primary and then center point can come back in. During that uh, transfer, we are going to have to keep a few systems up so we, we have an alternate in here for a generator to be able to do that. The, um, the other thing that we're asking for, just as a clarification for a blanket easement is, this is an easement that we would provide uh, center point. And the reason it's, it's called a blanket easement is so that it allows some leeway since we have we have our own uh, power line in there and we're gonna have to, as I said, put in a, a, a temporary and then they come and put their own. It allows leeway to go ahead and establish where that easement is actually going to be. And in the meantime, it also, by being a blanket easement, it gives Fort Bend ISD the leeway that if there's any glitches and before you know all the legal gets handled, we can still have power energized and we're not without, without power by going ahead and granting a blanket easement and I'll answer any questions that y'all may have. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Do, does anyone have any questions on this particular item, 6A1? You had, you had like, um, whatever it was, 88,000 or something. Jane, could you scroll back up? For a supplement, could you? But, uh, the budget amendment. Oh, so that's what we're basically asking for now because we already budgeted for the other stuff. Is that correct? Okay, okay never mind. Mrs. James. Dave, I didn't even understand your question. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right, though, Dave. It's okay. It was a special language I guess good mom. He understood it. He, he understood and that's all that matters, I guess. That's okay. Um, I I, uh, I have a question about there's this there's a, in the write up here it talks about a yes, on this page, right in the middle, it's talking about a notice to proceed allowing for the submittal process. What types of things have to be submitted for? Are those permits or some sort of, what, what is that? Uh, the submittal process is actually the materials that'll be utilized uh, in order to, to be able to complete the scope of work. So what we're asking is once we receive board approval, then we will go ahead and give a notice to proceed so that they can submit and then the architect or engineer, in this case the engineer, would review those to make sure they're in conformance with what it is that we're going to be installing. Once they approve, then the contractor can order those materials so they'll be ready uh, when we start doing the work in, for the switchover in March. Okay, so it's, that gives a chance to start the procurement of the materials or that they need? Is that, that is, am I understanding that correctly? That is correct. Okay, and I asked about the, uh, are you, 
you answered my question about what alternate one was, so I wasn't sure what that was. And then when it talks about center point in the budget section, there's a line, no, next page, yes, center point energy overhead. And is that referring to something that's going to go over people's heads? Or is that referring to um, something that's administrative costs? No, ma'am. That, that is actually the poles and the wires that will be bringing the power to the sites. Okay. Okay. As opposed to underground. Correct. Uh, great. I don't think I have any other questions. Great. Thank you. Moving on to item 6A2. You, this West Side uh, Ag Center. Yes, ma'am. Uh, once again, uh, the administrator uh, recommends and seeks approval for a construction services agreement with Bass Construction in the amount of two million six hundred eight. Project budgets totaling three million zero seventy one seven fifty seven, and budget amendments totaling eight hundred fifty six thousand seven fifty seven for the construction of the new West Side Ag facility an authorization for the superintendent schools to negotiate and execute the contract as described below. And uh, on this particular one, I'm also gonna ask Ashley to come up to, to help me uh, answer some of the questions that, that you may have as far as the project itself. One of the things that uh, I do wanna let you know right off the bat that uh, has come up from the time that we put this document together and now is that we have been notified that uh, there we will be some additional cost uh, because of some slurry drilling and that's going to be required for the foundation and uh, that has already occurred on uh, elementary 49 which is just you know right adjacent to it uh, what's happening with all the rain that uh, we had and everything the water tables have uh, risen and as they've gone in and started to drill they're encountering water at a fairly shallow uh, depth and uh, so at this point, they're providing a cost that we would bring back to you before next Monday uh, to let you know what that, uh, what that is. It doesn't mean that we're gonna expend all that amount, but if, if they start to go in and do their drilling and they run in that situation, we just wanna be sure that we can go ahead and do some slurry drilling, maintain the integrity of the hold before the concrete uh, goes in place. So, at this point, I'm going to let Ashley just speak a little bit uh, about the project. Sure. Uh, well, why don't we see if the board member... So let me, let me just make sure that I understand you're going to bring us the potential additional cost for the slurry drilling. You're going to get us that to us this week. Yes, ma'am, that is correct. So, you know, we were coming to you with a, a budget for you to, to approve but based on information that we received since we put this together, we need to go ahead and amend that budget. So when it comes to you on Monday, there'll be a, an increase of that 3,071,000. So there'll be an increase to that. It will be more than 3,071,757. Correct, and, and it's an increase of approximately $15,000. Okay, thank you, that, that's helpful. Um, do, do we have any questions on this one? Mr. Rosenthal? So, Basically, we're kind of over budget by 856,000. Is that what this is kind of saying? Uh, May I? Yes. Oh. Uh, you it's it's on. on. Okay. Uh, so actually, what we are proposing is the base bid along with the five alternates, and so uh, that 2608 includes all five alternates. Um, uh, that includes the. Uh, high volume, low speed fans, radiant heating system, removable livestock pins, and um, animal pins, and additional site lighting and security cameras. Uh, the base bid also, last time we came to you, we had indicated some additional costs that we were trying to uh, decipher based on the remoteness of the site. We found that we are going to have to have a sanitary sewer lift station, stormwater, and uh, a fire main. 
all of those were costs that we had proposed a, a potential budget below the line of what those would be, uh, with the exception <coughs> of the fire main, and we had indicated that we were meeting with the fire marshal that week. And so we did. It is required. Uh, the site is in between 49, elementary 49, and Travis, but it is in a remote um, location. We are not right on the um, access road, so it takes us a while to get there. Ms. Helliger. Okay, thank you. So I have some general questions maybe that you all can help me out. So one is about this particular budget. We've got, we're over 856000 When we initially did the initial requirements, we missed these pieces that you just described that you were adding in for 856000 So my, my question now is, and then we're going to come back again for $15,000 for the, the water the sewage drain and whatnot. So what's the confidence level of this particular bid? Also because you have in here a project contingency of actual of zero. Mm -hmm. What's the confidence level on this, on this budget? I actually feel really good about it. We actually, in, according to when we came with the uh, schematic design, we didn't have the local, the CV local policy that included to add design contingency and to actually set up the project budget as such that has the construction contingency. We did not have the soft cost in there. We've incorporated them in at this this point. Uh, I've worked with uh, some uh, Sean Bogle to look at uh, how they they furnished and equipped the, the past ag barns. Unfortunately, that data is 20 years old. So um, we did include a cost for uh, FF and E, fixtures, furniture, and equipment in this as well. So that, that budget c increase includes not only the construction, but also the actual turnkey delivery of the, the, the facility. So that's because we recently changed FFE? Is that why? That, Oscar, the. Yes, well, this project was brought to the board initially in 2007. Okay, okay, all right, enough said. Enough said. <laughs> okay, enough said. All right, so, um, so then, gen so in general, um, so this is a 2007 budget, so this particular company, Bass um, Construction, they were on the initial list of hierarchy to um, receive the next bid? No, we actually went out for CSP bids in May. We received three responses in June, and uh, they were awarded as the best uh, value. There's a actual matrix in there to show how the committee ranked them, not only on price, but it was a full. Okay. So then, all, so then, so this is my general question for the remaining th three, four, five, and three, four, five. Um, does the 2014 list that these uh, contractors um, who we are recommending to um, receive these bids, they are currently on our list, and we we didn't change we didn't change the bid package or the the bid numbers and all that the ranking. Did we change that? No, I mean, uh, <coughs> in this case, with when you're going out for a request for a proposal, you you don't have a list at that point. You're, you're uh, advertising, and you know different contractors will go ahead and bid the project. And this is one of the contractors that that bid the project. So we don't go out for bids for con con uh, for contractors. We only, I mean, so we don't. Um, prioritize or rank our contractors, we only rank our architects? Um, may I take that? Yes, sir. Um, in this case, we went out for a new competitive sealed proposal, and it's open for anybody to bid. Any interested party may bid. It's advertised for two consecutive weeks. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's on our website. Any interested party can bid. There's also a notification system that the district has that notifies over a thousand companies. So it's totally open. In this case, we received these three bids. So I'm not, I'm not talking just for 2007. I was just asking in general of the process. I know. Right. I know. Um, what is this number? Six two. I understand. It's 2007. Then three, four, and five was 2014 so we went out for a competitive bid for for those so we're saying that we're, there's no we're not using any type of 
um, rank list anymore. We, we've done away with that. Is that is that? Well, we're doing that. We oh. have that for the professional services for the architects. Okay. And so that's handled differently. The professional services handled differently than the contractors for the construction. So that was my question. Right. So do you okay. have? Okay. So it's, it's handled differently. I mean, because when these projects come up, I mean, they're you know obviously the dollars are big, but they're reacting to the market at that time. When we when we put the bid out, they're reacting to their own work or workloads and and such. And so we don't have a quote unquote approved list of contractors. Okay. We try to we contact all the players, make sure they know that that's out there. In the case of the professional services bid, we issued a, a, a request for qualifications earlier, and over a hundred companies responded to that. Is essentially the same process. You have to evaluate all of the proposals and rank them all out. But when we took that to the board, we, we received board approval to use those professional service providers for the 2014 bond program. Yeah, I just want to make sure as you know, I, I know a little bit more this year than I did last year, <laughs> just a little bit more, you know. And so I wanted to make sure that we were at least I understand what the consistent practices that we use for professional services versus contractors. I know we had lots of conversation last year around this time around that, so I just wanted to make sure I, I understood. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heliger. Ms. James? So I have a question about this um, project. Is this, it's listed here in the 2007 bond <laughs> program, is this project being managed by Jacobs or is it an in-house project? This is being managed by Fort Bend ISD. Okay. So one of the things I noticed on here was that, and maybe this was just an error, but that in the summary it talks about Jacobs being personnel being involved in scoring some of the criteria. So I just wondered if that was just because it was kind of cut and pasted from a different one or if that was actually true. I believe that they were used for safety. <coughs> that was to make it consistent with all of the, the projects that we had on 2014. They have the personnel that uh, can can assist us with that and evaluating that, that particular division. The rest of it was all done through uh, Fort Bend ISC personnel. Okay, so do th are they involved then in the safety evaluation of this project? Do, they, do we have some arrangement with them to provide safety services for these projects? No, ma'am. They only do it in the evaluation of the actual packet, bid package itself. So do we have a safety officer assigned to this construction project or, or safety, any type of safety personnel? Uh, no, ma'am. Not at this time. Ms. Heliger. When does it get assigned? Uh, there... Fort Bend ISD does not have a person that's designated just for safety. So the safety is the project manager that goes on site when they do their observations and everything. They go ahead and, you know, look for anything that may, you know, look unsafe and they bring that to the contractor's attention. So our pro project managers take on the responsibility of ensuring our safety, all of our safety measures for these, this type of work. That's their, that's their role? It is part of their, their role as they do their observations. Ms. James. I wonder if this might be a gap in our design and construction um, setup in the sense that it seems that safety on these types of projects is really important. And um, I just wonder if that might be a gap. We might want to look at doing something about Mr. Rice. So, Ms. Perez, will Bass Construction on during the construction of the Ag Barn, they're responsible for means and methods of construction and safety procedures. OSHA required safety procedures on the site. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. And they also submit to us a safety plan that we go ahead and approve. Okay. So then when our uh, staff, our project manager goes on site, they're, they're not, their primary job is not looking at safety. Their primary job is looking at this 
progress of construction and so forth, but if they notice safety issues, they'll bring them to the attention of the contractor, won't, will they not? Yes, sir, that is correct. So is this uh, site, it's between, I think we did a land swap right next to Travis High School, didn't we? Yes, sir. So is this, uh, is this occupied by children or students at Travis, or is it isolated from the high school? It is isolated. Okay, so it's pretty safe where it is. I mean, they've got a construction fence and everything around it. They, they will, there's not one presently, but there will be one once we get them on site, yes, sir. Part of their, okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Mr. Burdine, do you have anything? Thank you. Moving on to 6A3. Classrooms at Oyster Creek and Santa Cross. It's not necessary to read the full recommendation. I would just kind of explain it to the board in okay. general. Okay. What I'd uh, like to do before we get into these particular projects is I'd like to go ahead and go over two particular slides. Uh, the first one that we're looking at here is just a condensed Exhibit A. And Exhibit A is uh, the document that we have been providing each time we bring an item for your approval and a budget for your approval. At the, at the back of, of the memo that we submit, we have what we call Exhibit A. And it basically is a, a running total based on what y'all are approving and whether we are either giving money or we're taking money from contingency. And so when you look at this slide, the, the main thing we wanna see here is that as of uh, bid package 13, which is the last bid package that, that was board approved, we still have in our cumulative contingency a little over $6 million at, at this point. Now, as we, we go through tonight and different things get approved, then, then that number will be adjusted uh, and we'll I'll be able to show that, uh, you know, as I speak about the, the, the uh, individual items shortly. The second slide is our phase one uh, budget status report. And, and what this does is whenever we go ahead and, and we, we come in and we uh, have you all approve a project budget, then we use that information to go ahead and first of all, populate the slide that I just showed you, which was exhibit A, and then secondly, to populate this slide, which is uh, our forecast of where we feel that we're gonna be. And what this slide is, is showing you is that right now for new construction uh, in phase one, we have everything with actuals in there other than, and the reason we still show estimate is that we have FF&E and we have technology that will be procured out of that project budget that y'all have approved, but it's still at this point an estimate that we have in there and it's a placeholder. And what that line is showing, if you go all the way out to the right to the total, is it's showing that if we maintain that and we don't, we don't exceed those estimated budgets for FF&E and technology, then, then we will be zeroing out as far as uh, phase one. As you go to the uh, addition comparison, it's the same manner except that in this particular case, what we have right now based on the actuals and the, the estimates is that we're, we're showing that we actually have a shortage there. We're gonna need to put some money into this. And then going on to life cycle and uh, deficient comparison, what we're showing there is, and this is all based on, on estimates at this point. There's, well, there's some actual, but it's very small. Most of it is estimate, but, but what we're showing is we're estimating that at the end of phase one and two, we're going to be uh, four point million to the good uh, on, on this particular, as we look at this. So as we go forward a little bit, you're gonna, you're gonna see some decrease in, in our exhibit A and where we are in project contingency. But what we're showing here is that as we project this out based on the information we're bringing you, we see that then it's going to come down and then we project it to go back up. And uh, we still at this point are not tracking the phase three because we're just at the point that we're starting to bring the architects on 
board for that. We've given them letters of intent, but we don't have it under contract. So once we do that and they start providing us budgets and everything, then we'll start populating this and, and take it from there. And then this is a, this is a, a fluid item. It's, it's a living document. And, you know, as more things become actual, you know, it gets adjusted. But this is the, the best tool that we have to be able to feel comfortable as we're bringing projects to you. Uh, so I'll answer any other questions you may have about these two slides before I move forward. So just to make sure that I understand, on slide one, you're showing 6.4 million currently yes. at, of contingency. And, and that is before we come to you with projects tonight that will be approved next Monday. Okay, so, so that's this where we will are go as down right based on this will go down correct but ultimately you are estimating that at the end of phase two end of phase one and phase two that we will be 4.1 million uh we'll have a 4.1 million surplus in in our contingency in our and, contingency and that is that is based on the assumption that you approve the project budgets that we're bringing to you, which is going to draw it down, and then as we move forward, we're we're projecting that it's going to go back up. Okay, and you and we we don't have any estimates for phase three at this time. Not at this point. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood. Are, are there questions yeah. by the board, Mr. Rosenthal? Just to continue with that, so the six point seven million that you're showing is a difference now where you were. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, the shortage for the shortage of the for the additions um, is that that's included in that 4.1 uh, yes sir it's it uh, well actually it is it is not included in the 4.1 the 4.1 is a, the projection once we bring in the life cycle deficiency okay right but so that but it's in yeah. yes sir it, it you're, is you're accounting for it correct we are okay but if at this point in time okay we are up six point something, six and, point four. and now because with these new things that you're bringing us, we're actually down. So we're kind of evenish, maybe a little, right? We're what what you'll see here shortly is that uh, if you approve all of the projects, it's going to bring this six point four down to about five million. I mean, uh, five hundred uh, uh, thousand. Right. Okay. And then we're saying, but with the projections right. that we As have we continue, here, we're right. going to. You right. know, bring it back but a up. snapshot as of approval of this stuff next week, should we all this get approved, then we're within 500,000. Yes, sir. Got it. This is James. Well, let me just ask a clarifying question to Mr. Rosenthal's question. So, uh, Ms. Perez, what you're saying is that all of these projects that are in the 2014 bond are ha are in sum about six million dollars over budget. No. No. Okay. Let me let me take a stab at that. I mean, what for the for the new construction that we have in phase one and phase two, we think we're going to be breaking even. For the additions that are in phase one and phase two, we're going to be down 6.7. But we think that that's going to be made up by the by the renovations, the the life cycle and deficiency comparisons that we have already scoped out through the work with the architects and the engineers for phase one and phase two. This doesn't include this estimate doesn't include any of the phase three work that is just that we're just now getting with the architects on. Okay, I think, I think you might have misunderstood my question. If you look at slide one, our current status is 6,400 something thousand, the other slide, not this, the other slide one, there you go. 6.4 million, okay? And what I thought I heard him say was that at, if these projects that are on our agenda right now were to be approved, they're using Five point something million of that six point four, and so it's they are roughly over budget six million dollars, maybe a little bit less, which is going to draw our cumulative 
program contingency down to the five hundred thousand dollar range. Yes, ma'am. Whatever. Okay. So that's so I understand that. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Rice. Oh, I think Mrs. Chair. Are you not? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, then I just had another question. It's when I compared these projects, which is I guess I don't have any more questions on this, so I have questions more specifically on the particular projects. Okay. So, Mr. Rice? No. Okay. We'll move on to the particular projects. All right. So, we'll, yes, we're. So with that said, then we'll, we'll move on to uh, the bid packages, which will be bid package 8, bid package 10, and bid package 11. Good. And uh, on just to kind of give you all just a high-level synopsis on this, on the, on the additions for each one of these, these basically were additions that are, for the most part, prototypes. In other words, the, the, we took the schools that were pretty much mirror images of each other. And other than, than uh, the um, uh, Cornerstone, which is a 12 classroom, all of them are just 10 classroom additions. All of these based on the uh, proposals that we received are coming in at uh, about, around 214 to $229 a square foot is where, where these are, are coming in. Uh, Cornerstone, which is a 12, came in at about $195 a square foot. Part of the reason that we, you know, we spoke about being over budget by the $6 million, part of the reason that they came in higher was, first of all, when we first budgeted these, uh, when we went out for the bond, we were not looking at uh, the 21st century. We've brought that in, so that increased, and in there was some additional square footage that came into play by some of the flex spaces and, and the different things that we had to do there. But then also in addition to that, there was the code requirements that, that happened to us. And on, on a numerous campuses, we had to go in and do fire, uh, uh, actual fire lanes to get back to them to be able to, to get these permitted. So those were costs that uh, it appeared were not originally in the budget. And so that's some of where this increase came in. Uh, another thing is that we ended up uh, where these additions are now situated, they're in some cases were playgrounds, which have to be removed and then have to be relocated and set back up. Those were some of the additional cost. So with, with that said, it, uh, we're, we feel that we've received some good budget uh, numbers on this. The one thing that has occurred, once again, from the uh, time that we submitted this to uh, actually this past uh, Friday was that we received notification that uh, prime contractors was going to pull out from bid package 11. And so what that means is that we uh, had to send notification to them, uh, you know, terminating any, um, any of the negotiations that we had, and then we have to go back to the second uh, a parent low proposer and negotiate with them and we would want to go ahead and bring that back so there, there would have to be a change here because prime has, has already let us know that they they felt that uh, they did not have the proper personnel uh, to, to be able to deliver as they felt as a company they could deliver and definitely they they felt that they were not going to be able to deliver to, to Fort Ben ISD standard and so you know, those things happen at times, uh, but we we feel that we have a good second proposer. Uh, the original bid was approximately 200000 uh more than, than uh, Prime. That's before any type of negotiation. So we feel, even though it's, it's a hiccup, we feel comfortable that, that we can come back to you with a um, good contractor. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Mrs. James? Do you feel like you'll be bringing that next week, or is that some, is that for next month, or do you have any, you, I guess you guys really can't tell at this point. We would uh, like to do everything that we can to bring it next week. 
these projects are slated to be finished uh, for the beginning of the school year. And uh, even though we do have a little bit of float and, and if we needed to, we could come in September on this particular project, but if they're, you know, we're gonna try everything we can to, to bring it uh, for Monday. So could you just clarify a little on the timeline on these projects then? They're starting soon and what, could you yes, clarify we, the timeline please? We would go ahead and uh, sign contracts uh, uh, right after board approval and then uh, give uh, issue notice to proceed and then the work would uh, commence uh, on the additions of portables and all have already been moved out of the way so they're no longer in the way the contractor can go ahead and move forward and get started. Thank you, Mrs. James. Any other questions on bid packages eight, 10, or 11? I have a, another question then. Mrs. James. And it had to do with, I didn't, I wasn't quick enough. You said the cost per square footage, but I missed it. You said on the cornerstone it was 195 per square foot and then the others ranged, what was the range? They, they range from uh, approximately uh, 214 to 229. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Perez. I think we're ready to move on to item 6B, which is review of proposed revisions to EG Local. Dr. Dupree? Yes, actually, um, Cynthia is still here somewhere, and Dr. Hill, yes, Cynthia and um, Cynthia Rincon, our general counsel, and Dr. Phyllis Hill have worked on this. I would point out we've provided you an updated version of the policy based on some feedback previously received by the board earlier today. And Jane has the um, current, most current version that will be on the board on the screen um, during the discussion. At this point, I think um, we'd, we're really ready for the board. We're ready to engage with the board's questions. Okay. Do we have questions from the board? AG Local. I know we do. This is James. All right. Um, I only find the most up-to-date version here. I, I, um, I looked at this quite a lot and I was trying to understand what, um, you know, what, what we we're kind of going for here. I like the concept of, um, using the term philosophy, um, and I think that that was good, but then I started thinking about is this a curriculum philosophy is this a curriculum development philosophy is this a philosophy about delivering curriculum and it, it and that's in a high level way I started sort of getting um, I guess distracted because I was really just trying to figure out what are we what are we trying to do with this policy and I think one of the things that really um, kind of, I don't I won't say bothered me, but sort of got me thinking is um, what, uh, we're working really hard on developing our curriculum and, in, and it's now at a point in time, but have we looked ahead to think about what curriculum should look like in five years or ten years. And if this policy is about curriculum development, then it sort of got me thinking we should be either broader or forward thinking in having a conversation about it. I know that gets us way off the track of what's written on this piece of paper, but I guess that's where I'm, that's kind of where I'm coming from in this um, in this conversation, so um, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. And then I, I had some. 
So, so I think it would, it's important to share a little bit of the history of this policy. This policy actually comes out of the work that the board did with CRSS, and that is where this, um, the basis of this policy is coming from. So we're actually working to get a better understanding now, um, having lived with this policy for about a year, of what the board envisions this policy to mean. So this, those are good questions because we too probably have the same types of questions. But I think it's important for, for the board to know that that's where this came from, from the work with CRSS. So then we've gone back and tried to, um, in listening to the questions that we've received from the board and in working in all the work that the board has done on other policies and in listening to the concerns about curriculum and, and curriculum development, we've gone back and tried to clarify a lot of the terms that were used and tried to make them to fit in what we're doing as a district and, and what we think the board is, is uh, sharing with us when they ask, with the questions that you have and things like that. So that's just a little history piece of this. Okay, and I think that is good. And I agree that it is, that is the history and it's, we're, you know, we're sort of a work in progress, right? We've mm -hmm. said we're building the airplane as we're flying around. So we're, <laughs> so we, we, you know, and now we're kind of going back through and we're trying to refine, um, trying to refine things. And I think a lot of the additions here, I know we talked about this a couple of months ago, we put in some additions, and I think uh, even more of the additions that are here help to integrate other of, of our policies into this policy. So from that standpoint, um, so from that standpoint, I like it. Um, I guess what is f frankly throwing me for a loop, and I didn't have an opportunity to do enough homework on this, but just the title, curriculum development causes me to wonder is this really the is this really curriculum develop the policy that guides curriculum development or is this is the is it curriculum or is it is it really two couple of different ideas that we've sort of morphed into one policy and we've just using that title as a placeholder? So that might be a little bit of a deep question, to, but it, it, it is one that I'm pondering because I'm not, I'm not totally comfortable with all these pieces and how they fit together. If I could, let me ask a question. We took out the language about curriculum framework. Was that, is that, where did that terminology come from? Is that something that's in the law, or was it a term that we just used or borrowed from another district at some time? I think it was really, curriculum framework is, is only referenced, I think, once in the Texas Education Code, but I think this came from borrowed language out of the work with CRSS. When I went back and looked at several other districts, there, there aren't many districts that have this work in EG Local. Um, but there are districts that we can tell the boards did similar work, and that's where we changed to philosophy because we did feel like the board was trying to um, provide the philosophy about curriculum and not really, the, the word framework was throwing everyone off, I think, because there is a piece to the curriculum that's a, that's a framework, and I, I would defer to Dr. Hill and, and um, Dr. Faust on that. Legal, E H. AA refers to uh, state curriculum frameworks. And also when we had our curriculum audit with TASA, they referred to uh, frameworks of curriculum that included goals and objectives. And that's the way our curriculum is arranged with learning objectives. And so when we began to work with the policy that you had worked on in your retreat, we were interweaving the state's legal document, the audit document, and trying to, to also address that we were going to have a framework for continuous re renewal, development, revision of the curriculum, because that was one of the things that the audit committee 
didn't feel like we had strong policies around the governance piece, the organizational structure. Remember, we redid the organizational chart and a curriculum management plan that was really a living document that would guide our work in years to come. And also, they decided that we needed stronger planning processes, which we've been working on. There were like nine recommendations that we detailed for you in December as progress, a progress monitoring report. But that's where curriculum framework came both from the state's document and the audit report. Okay, and that's kind of where we ended the conversation previously because we were saying, well, it says in the policy we're supposed to approve it. We don't even know what it is, and we couldn't really identify it. So I think that's appropriate then that it's that language is taken out because it doesn't seem like something that the board should approve. But then when I read this, when I read this as it exists right now in this draft form, I was concerned because I didn't see where the board was involved in uh, approving curriculum goals or f yes. philosophy or, um, and that that was an up, and how that would be an ongoing process. So it's one thing to approve a philosophy like this that's, as it's written up there, that's quite general and aligns with our core beliefs, but it's another one, another thing to have that sort of um, be in a place where it can be, where it can evolve and where the board can give regular input to it. I, and I think, again, this is where our conversation derailed last time because we talked about a curriculum plan that came to the board, but again, that wasn't approved by the board, it was just presented. And so <coughs> when I l look at this policy and I think about curriculum development, I feel like somewhere in here we need to have a mechanism for the board's input into whether we call it a philosophy or whether we call it goals or something. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm looking, I'm trying to figure out where that fits. I mean, obviously it fits in the part that says the board's, the board's part of the, um, you know, the board's uh, responsibilities. But what do we call that and where does, where does that exist now? This is James, I, I, now I'm gonna speak and Cynthia and Phyllis, you can tell me if I'm on the right path. I think what you are describing is what we're attempting to do with this policy. Because ultimately the board's job is to adopt policy. And that policy can be whatever you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And if it needs specific goals, if it's got the things you're looking for, then we, I think we, we've been operating from the assumption it would be here. And then that's our marching orders as staff to go write curriculum and teach curriculum based on the board's expectations. So I th my view is that all the things you're describing are what we need, what the, we need the board's guidance on what to put in here. And then that directs us going forward. Mm -hmm. And this of course is a living document to the extent the board is always able to change it whenever they want to adopt changes to it. I mean, does that, does, I mean, does that, what do you, what does that sound like? Yeah, I think that sounds, that sounds okay, but I also feel like there needs to be a mechanism for, uh, that comes back to the board every, I don't know what the time period is, but if the mechanism is in the policy, then the review of the goals or the mm -hmm. philosophy it, it, it allows it to become a conversation topic. If we don't put the mechanism in the policy, then we get, you know, swamped with everything else and we forget that, yes, it should come from policy. So maybe we could clarify well, on this section. A second, a second. The way, what I'm closely relating to and what you're describing is what we've done with our annual enrollment review. Right. So you've put in policy that every year we'll have our demographic study and we will come to the board in January, and that's written in policy to share how we're going to address growth for that year. And so I'm almost seeing, I think this is where Cynthia is going, almost a mechanism in this policy that it's because basically what you're asking for is a policy review. So it's the, and it could be more specific to say 
annually or every, you know, biannually, however you, often the board chooses to say it, it will, this will be brought forward for review to affirm change or whatever the goals, objectives of the curriculum. But that trigger, the time frame trigger would be written in here within the same policy we're reviewing. And yeah. there, there is the expectation that the superintendent would annually provide to the board an oversight report of the implementation of the district curriculum aligned to the curriculum management plan. So in that report, it's the expectation that um, the, the administration would provide information regarding the implementation, would provide information, and that would give the board the opportunity to have discussion about the curriculum management plan, about the implementation, the instructional resources being used, um, and the policy itself. Mm -hmm. what page, what page is that's that on page five of seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say if, if that's how we're gonna do it, then it should we should add a phrase in that section that indicates that the policy would be brought forward at the same time the oversight report mm -hmm. was brought forward. Um, and, and then I'll just emphasize again, then this is a curriculum development policy. And it's not a, it's not other things. It's a curriculum development policy. Maybe it's, a com maybe it's an implementation policy because we've got some parts of it are implementation, especially when we start talking yeah, about teachers that's what and I was say. administrators. <laughs> so I don't know if these two things need to be separated out um, in some way, or, or we need to change the title. title. Yeah, the, the first few pages sorry, is more of a, sorry. Go ahead. Is more of a to me definitely philosophy and then because I was getting confused too I and mean, then towards the end it, it talks more of a directive and and how to implement this because that's what I was concerned with is really how does this philosophy then move into the actual curriculum delivery and I was trying to figure out where, where the pieces connected there um, so if this is the if this is the philosophy, where's the what's the word I'm looking for? Where where's the actual implementation, implementation plan. plan? So so I think you're talking about the curriculum, the curriculum management, management, plan. management plan. Okay. And it does in the legal document, legal E H A A states that before the adoption of a major curriculum initiative, including the use of a curriculum management system, the district must use a process that, and it outlines then a three-step process. I think some of the things that we're talking about, some are in the board's EA local that was developed a couple of years ago. I think some are in EHAA legal, which are very explicit and detailed. And uh, certainly, this is, this is your local policy, and we want you to be pleased with it and it to function in the way you want it to function. Uh, but the curriculum management plan is the nuts and bolts of the, the processes, the timelines, and, uh, and it's, it's much longer and detailed in the actual implementation. Yes, ma'am, I have a copy of that in the briefcase sitting on the floor next to me. And it is much longer. And we don't want, we don't need that level of detail in the policy, and we certainly don't that level of detail should, I don't believe, should be subject to board action. But I, but um, we do need the board footprint on it, mm -hmm. and we do need, you know, kind of the headliners on it. So, just like many of the many of the plans that you that it, all of you have brought to us have come out of the core beliefs and commitment statements. This is the same type of thing, but I think what, what past history and, may, and what we're kind of leaning towards is something that's a little more defined philosophy 
that helps to headline and guide what um, what our intentions are. Um, so I, I think we're on the right track. I just think I'm, I'm not sure what the I'm not sure exactly what the tweaks are that we need to do to, to make it work. Mr. Rosenthal. I agree. I think we are on the right track. I agree with what you guys are saying. Um, to me, I think that the philosophy is kind of part of this. Maybe like the opening paragraph is what the board believes as far as development of curriculum and just you know, we've had several examples over the past year or two where we've sat up there and had discussions about resources and, mm -hmm. you know, whether uh, uh, the, the system is working or whether it's not working. We, we, I actually watched that video a few weeks ago, and that went on for about an hour and a half. Um, and then, you know, I brought up something, if, you know, a month ago or so, where, you know, we talked about the TEKS, you know, is how, how broad, you know, does the board think that, that we should go. No, I, I don't know if, if that's part of what we, when we talk about philosophy, I don't know if that's what we're talking about. Um, but I think that we should all kind of have an understanding, you know, of, and, and kind of an agreement and, um, you know, have those discussions in a, in a separate workshop. I hate to ask for another meeting, but, um, mm -hmm. and it's really kind of flush yeah. that stuff out. Well, so I'm making making some notes here, and it, it sounds like, uh, I mean, one of the things I'm hearing, and actually this was this would have been my perspective as well, is I like having the philosophy in here, and I I agree with some of the things that are in here, but I'm not sure that the board has had that conversation, in order because right. it, to me a philosophy is a what do we believe statement. But we've ha we've had it, but it's been bits and pieces, and it hasn't really all been compiled. And so you know. it, perhaps perhaps we need a workshop. We need we need a workshop uh, on this particular. I would agree. I, I would I would like to interject though. I mean I think the board had rich conversation around this when they wrote it three years ago. Because remember that was a whole series of work. But I don't know that everyone, currently not everybody on the board was on the board at that time right. even. Right. And so I do think you know it kind of comes back to Mr. James what you've been saying. It needs revisiting by the board on a regular basis and I think that's what I'm hearing is that concern we need to revisit it now to make sure it reflects the current views of the board. Well and I think we need to be sure that this particular policy is focused on what we want it to be focused on because you know when you look at the title it does talk about development but it also talks about delivery and so if, if that's what this policy is going to be then it, it needs to reflect that and probably in a little more organized way where if we do start with our philosophy and we talk about what the board believes and then we can detail that out and this is how development is going to stem from that and then this is how delivery is going to stem from that and this is how assessment is going to stem from that. So it give, makes, you know, it's what I'm hearing is that we, I think we need to maybe get consensus on that and then maybe organize this policy a little bit better so that we're all in agreement uh, on what what marching orders we're giving. Does that sound good? You agree with that? Yes, and I will say that I, I excuse me for jumping in again. I think that, um, I think that um, it, I rem remember as we were going through some of the other policies, it, and I think in this, in maybe in this section, but we kind of got t to a, through a phase where we're like, we need a philosophy about this, we need a philosophy about this, we need a whole section of philosophies. Um, but, but maybe this can be sort of a, a kind of a state leaping off point because I think assessment was one of the things we talked about having a philosophy around. So if we either put that in this policy or we have a workshop about this and spring, spring off of that into the assessment, then we, then we, you know, I think that would be pretty awesome because for the people that are working on the curriculum revisions, if they've got some good guidance on what the philosophy is, we're what our priorities are and what the philosophy is, then I think it directs and makes the work much, much more clear. Um, instead of what I sensed here in reading this and just overall was kind of a tug of war between the teaks, the thousands of teaks, 
and the, but we also want to teach critical thinking. <laughs> and, and this whole, uh, I, I really did sense kind of a tug of war, so I think it would be some good conversation. Well, and since teaching and learning are our core business, I think it's going to be important that we get this right, and we'll probably drive some of the strategic planning that we're doing over the next year. So, okay, were you? Well, I'd like to clarify then that we will not bring this forward for approval next week. But I also would like to ask that we really make this a high priority because two of the board's priorities for the coming year are linked directly to this. Mm -hmm. And so we need this done as soon as we can so that so we can move along with our, our work. So we can we can work together to pick uh, a time that's that's agreeable to the board and to staff to get together and do this as quickly as possible. Is that yeah. Yeah, agreement? and I had typed a lot of questions. Um, some around language things, but some again around this sort of general philosophy thing. And I think I copied, uh, well, I copied uh, Mrs. Martinez. So at least you have that in the, um, you know, background there. Okay. We will move on then to 6C, which has several proposed agreements and memoranda. One being between Fort Ben ISD and Wharton County Junior College <laughs> for the Ridgemont Early Childhood Center Literacy Program. Do we have a presentation? No presentation on these. Okay, do we have questions from the board on C1? Hearing none, moving on. C2 is between Fort Ben ISD and Big Brothers and Big Sisters for Marshall High School. Do we have questions from the board? Mrs. James. Okay. <laughs> Maybe 49. No, we never get that one. 49. <laughs> turn, your, turn your microphone on. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't recorded. Um, okay. So. I really like this idea because uh, I like the kind of the intentionality of it. Um, do we, was there any um, estimation of the number of students that we would be trying to serve or w we would, you know, that we would like to serve or that would we, we'd be targeting at this point? The counselors at Missouri City Middle School uh, were responsible for recommending the students who would participate and they recommended 20 students who were are rising ninth graders so far they have uh, 12 uh, approved big brothers big sisters so it's not looking like they're going to come up with the full 20 they indicate that they think 15 may be a more realistic number for this first year uh, but they're very excited about it. They feel like there's a good process to match students with the, the mentors. And what are our obligations on the, uh, in this partnership? To help with the matching and provide the space. They will have the meetings at the campus and we are scheduling so that it doesn't take away from class time. It's before school, after school, at lunch and so forth. Great, thank you. Ms. Helliger. Just a quick question. So is the, for this particular program, since we don't have the 20, um, if there, is there a certain application that we can work with Big Brothers and Big Sisters for those who want to support the school, um, the district with this particular initiative? You could get in touch with Pamela Shaw mm -hmm. and she could help direct you to that source if you might have some additional mentors that would be interested. Okay, all right, so we, are we working with the community on this? This is still one of those opportunities I think that we should be reaching out to our community um, leaders to get the support for this. We are, one of the reasons we're working with Big Brothers Big Sisters is because they're a well-known entity and they've got all of the mechanisms in place mm -hmm. to do the vetting and so we can certainly refer folks to them, but they're also, they've got a full team dedicated to work recruiting. So 
I, I consider our partnership with them an extension into the community because that, well, that's the way we're not having to build our own, our own programming. Yeah, I understand that. So one of the things that I'm trying to help us understand, it, and I'm not sure that we do on all cases, I'll put it that way, is that we've got, I know, churches and communities around these areas that have not been tapped, mm -hmm. have not been asked to support these initiatives that we have to support those schools right there in the community. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm referring to. So if you've got five slots or six slots that are um, empty for Big Brothers Big Sisters, let's contact those churches that or whomever and organizations to say, hey, can you all have people come out, call Pamela Shaw at this number, have a flyer out there and says, we're looking for, for adults to support the Big Brother Sister program with um, Marshall High School. Mm -hmm. I don't think we do enough of that. And, and it's every time we talk about this, I'm a little frustrated because we always have these gaps and we don't have enough of this, we don't have enough of that. But when I talk to people, I go to churches and visit churches on a regular basis, I don't see anything in their community bulletins. I don't see anything on their, in, the, in their programs. I don't see it and I don't hear it. So I really want us to do, I really, you know, we say we're reaching out to the community. I just don't know how we're doing it. I really need for us to find five, six people to finish this program out. I, I would agree with that because has this been publicized anywhere on the website or anything? Everything goes through a big brother, big sister organization for this particular program. They do, they run the whole show. Right, but, but can't we, can't we, yeah, I mean, if we're partnering with them, I mean, I would think, because this is, I mean, seeing this memo, this is the first I've heard of it, you know, and it, you could reach out to all communities, not just right around the area. I mean, there's probably lots of people. I mean, I was a big brother many, many years ago, you know, and, and it's a great program. And um, there's probably a lot of people that would say, hmm, never thought about that, or I've heard about it, that would be interested in doing it, whether they're in that area or they're not in that area. So um, I really do. I, I agree. I think we really I need agree. to get the word out. and. And I'm honestly not certain how extensive the matching process and so forth is. You've been in the program. It, it was, well, it was, phew, geez, 20 years ago or so, 25 years ago. It's pretty, it's pretty it's intense. It is. Um, but, um, I mean. But I think Ms. Hellinger is right. I'm sure there are people in our community mm -hmm. who, given the need, would volunteer or be interested and so I'll share that with can we it sounds can we get you guys to give us an update on that and how we're gonna uh, reach out to the community and try to fill those slots because my that was my first thought is it's five people I think we could find five can you guys let us know how we as a district can we can do that look into filling thank you an update Okay, C3, agreement between Fort Bend and Texas Women's University Dietetic Internship. Do we have questions on C3? All right, C4, agreement between Fort Bend ISD and the University of North Florida's Brooks College of Health regarding acceptance of dietetic interns. Mrs. James. I just have a comment that I know we've had a couple of more of these come to us last month or maybe the month before, and I just appreciate the partnerships we're building with a variety of institutions to get, you know, new people, new ideas, and new information into our school system, and I, I value that a lot. So thanks to the people who are getting out there and making these connections, because I think it, it will make a difference for our children. Thank you, Mrs. Um, James. I wanted to Ms. add Gordon. to that and say I, I like the fact that we're actually going out of the Houston area as well. Um, there's lots of fine learning institutions all over the state, and it's just refreshing to see. So, Thank you, Mr. Burdine. All right, C5, agreement between Fort Bend ISD and Fort Bend County regarding Saved by the Bell. Do we have questions on this? Mrs. James. 
Well, we kind of talked about it before, and um, and I guess what this is 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 we're making a commitment for of two hundred forty thousand um, dollars for the caseworkers, and I think that Dr. Whitbeck, you were saying earlier, and maybe Dr. Carlson as well, that this is adding value to our students um, in terms of uh, helping them and um, uh, doing home visits and, and providing and helping identify needs of our students. And so um, for that reason, I think that it's, I think that it's good in the sense that I, from what I understand is it's helping with our, with our truant, it's helping our truant students. Um, so I guess that's my I guess that's a comment my, my question that I'd actually written down was you know what's this investment getting us and I guess you know you sort of answered that in the sense that it's it's catching 125 students that maybe and, and, and meeting their needs I think was the number um, and so there you go right there were like 475, I think, home visits, um, over a thousand different counseling sessions. So quite a lot of um, boots on the ground is how I would describe um, their assistance at this point and being more proactive than reactive. Yeah, and, and I think some support of our administrative staff as well in terms of be on campus. I've seen these folks on campuses uh, meeting with students and, and um, being involved in uh, in their in their lives, really. Yes. So, okay. Thank you, Mrs. James. All right, C6, uh, memorandum of agreement between Fort Bend and the school psychology program at Our Lady of the Lake. Do we have questions on this? All right, moving on to C7, agreement between Fort Bend and the school psychology program at Trinity University. Questions on this? <laughs> C8, agreement between Fort Bend and the School Psychology Program of the University of Texas at San Antonio. We're getting around, getting around. It is good. And finally, C9, agreement between Fort Bend and Cinecor Foundation regarding provision of substance abuse treatment for adolescents at Ferndale Henry. Do we have questions on this agreement? Mrs. James. I don't have a question, but I do, I was asked, you can't get away from school district business even when you go on vacation. I was asked if, by a friend of mine if we had applied for any SAMHSA grants, um, which are um, around this same sort of topic, substance abuse, and they're more, uh, from what I could understand from her, community-based um, and involve a lot of coordination between um, organizations in the community. And it made me think of our community because we do such a good job networking between organizations. So um, I'm just throwing that out there. I, it's not something I've seen before, but it might be something we might want to look at if, um, if we're looking for uh, intervention there was substance abuse and also um, mental health um, mental health uh, money available when I looked at the website and I thought that's an area where we need to bolster our um, maybe our services to kids also so uh, that was just an idea thank you mrs. James all right D we get to talk about WADA and our chapter 41 status. I assume that's you, Mr. Bassett. <laughs> Do we have questions? Yeah. Mr. Rice. Yes, thank you. <coughs> so, Mr. Bassett, we've, we've reached a point where I'm losing my power. Mm -mm. We, we've got five options none of which are very attractive except for option number three, purchase attendance credits. And so what does that look like? How much does that cost us to, to purchase attendance credits? And then the flip side is we won't lose any funding. 
No, I mean, there's no there's no cost associated with the, with this oh. option. I mean, in a way, it, it's really a, a formality. I mean, we're we're above three hundred nineteen thousand per wada per weighted average okay. uh, daily attendance, and so we're far far below the recapture level where we would actually have to uh, pay any funding back to the state. That level is at five hundred four thousand per wada. So I mean, we have many many years, you know, before we would get there. But uh, there isn't a, uh, a cost associated with us choosing option three. Uh, okay. There's a number of districts that are in our, our boat where we're technically a chapter 41 district, but we're, but we're well below the, the recapture level. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice, for clarifying that. Any other questions on this? All right, 6E. Items regarding district taxes, number one, is setting the date, time, and place to conduct public meeting to receive information, comments, and taxpayers' views on the 2016 school district tax rates. Thanks for the presentation, Liz. Yes, sir. Dr. Dupree. Well, this is an item, as you recall, um, when you adopted the budget, we discussed um, what the tax rate might be for the coming school year, and we, it will be necessary to conduct a hearing if we want to keep the rate at 30 cents as opposed to considering the 28 cent rate discussed during the budget process. So Steve's going to kind of talk about that this evening and again uh, along with some other ideas. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. So I did uh, what we'll, we'll go through some of the news and highlights. I've already gone through most of that. Talk a little bit about debt service because again, this is, this is impacting the debt service fund a little bit on property values and our tax rate and then what the next steps would be. So I did roll through this slide. What I skipped over was some of the information on the remarketing and the refunding, but I have some specific slides on that that I'll show you here in a minute. But the, the, this slide is from uh, the, a repeat from the first presentation. So just uh, so you can see graphically, oil um, you know, was, was definitely went lower, uh, went below 40 for the first time in a while. And so you know, we're, we're always looking at that because of the impact that it has on the state budget. So you know, it's not just the, the locally, but also on the, on the state budget. If you look, it's been a few months since I've showed you this slide. So this is the sales tax trending for the state overall, not, not locally. This is for the state overall. And so if you look at the, the trend back in, uh, what was it, 2009, before the large funding crisis of the state, you can see that the, the slope wasn't too strong too bad the first part of the year, but then it really went down the second half of that year. I don't know if that's going to happen again. It would have to take us down to here, but, but, it, but this isn't great in terms of the first part of the year. And so we're, we really have to keep an eye on this going into this coming session. But, but this kind of information doesn't really make me optimistic with regard to what's happening from a state funding perspective. And that's why we're on our compensation recommendation. It's more along the lines of, of the one-time supplement as opposed to ongoing salary increases. Uh, on the good news, uh, we did have a refunding uh, on the debt service um, that we, we did. So again, what a refunding is, is, is basically if you have a mortgage and, and you, you want to refinance your mortgage. So we had a number of bonds that, uh, um, uh, uh, that were going to be, that were issued in 2006. They had a call date in 2016. Uh, but you can see we were paying interest with coupons between 3.5% and 5% uh, over that time. We have, uh, whenever we did the, um, the refunding, our true interest cost for the uh, uh, 70 million that was, that was reissued is uh, just under 1.9%. And you can see those maturities ranging from uh, 2017 through 2026. 20, but really happy with that uh, true interest cost. And so our net present value savings was uh, was over 15 million. Part of that was just you know being patient and, and waiting. I mean, you know the underwriters really you know they get paid when we do transactions, but uh, uh, these numbers look better when we wait. And so I like to wait. Uh, but uh, having that percentage you know is very strong. But but 15.1 uh, million was was a good result. What was even more exciting was the remarketing we did. So so this was the first uh, variable rate transaction that we had. The, uh, uh, the, the 15, uh, 2015A, the, f the original 50 million, and what we had outstanding was 33 million. And so with the original 
nothing was changed with regard to the bond order, but our original pricing date was going to be July 12th. And so um, uh, we were just keeping an eye on the market, but because of everything that happened with Brexit and, and uh, the rest of the bond market, uh, we did move up the timetable uh, by five days. And we, we were very fortunate that we hit, that we went to the market in time where, where supply, not only were things, you know, it was turbulent throughout the, the world, but supply of new money issues coming in was very low, which was good for us. And so uh, it, it's just amazing for us to be able to say we borrowed 33 million for two years at 0.9, you know, so less than 1%. And so in comparison to our two-year note from the prior year, that was almost a $700,000 savings in debt in uh, interest costs. So that's pretty good. Plus the, the step rate was lower, which is a bonus. I mean, we don't ever see the step rate ever happening. That's if we can't remarket something. Um, I think that the only time that w happened it was back in the, the Lehman crisis in 2008, but they still look at that. But we're pretty excited about the remarketing and how that turned out. So that's that's now fixed for two years at two point years. nine. Okay, two years at point nine. So pretty pretty exciting. Uh, exciting for us. I mean, you know, other people think <laughs> other things are exciting. We get excited about this. We're a bit strange that way. Sorry. Uh, okay, so. The, the, the point of this the point the point of this is just to remind everybody if you could look at the bottom right we still have 447 million in in outstanding you know authorized but unissued debt and so you know we're 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 trying to keep that out I mean we don't have to start paying debt until we issue and so this is why you know we're going to get into the commercial pro paper program we'll be bringing that to you all next month uh, but but you can see we have a lot of activity, a lot's going on, and we're being able to manage it with the, the funds that we have had, we have issued so far. Uh, but our debt structure is very positive. You know, again, within 20 years, uh, uh, almost 98 percent of our debt's going to mature within 20 years. So we have plenty of capacity in the out years, you know, for w whenever phase two comes along. But we went into the, we went through this in great detail with the bond oversight committee uh, earlier, so it, it was it was very well received. Uh, we have uh, you know other other uh, you know bullets in our holster with regard to other refundings that are going to be coming. Uh, there, the next one won't be until uh, this uh, to do it on a current basis wouldn't be until the summer of 2018. Now, if the market does stay the way it is now into next year, I may consider an advance refunding for the first time in a while, and that's because the, the negative arbitrage while we'll still have some. Uh, to be able to refund 159 million at the rates that we have now, it, it might be worth it. So we'll be talking about that next summer. And uh, so, but there's nothing. There are people that want us to do that now. What are the rates on those? Uh, well, the I don't have the maturity. I don't yeah, have the uh, the coupons, but four. Th four. Mm -hmm. They're they're going to be you know fours and fives. Okay, the the coupons for those. And so we would definitely save money, but the, but the negative arbitrage is, is almost four million dollars, and I don't want to I don't want to eat that right now. Um, so anyway, there's a, a, a lot. We're always looking at this, and these are the you know, some of the things we do to help manage our debt. Okay, so you got the I chart, so you really got to look at the the single page ones that you that you have. But I, I've been through these charts before with you to show you the you know what the, what the columns are, but the 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 main thing here is that we had this existing debt service. You can see the the result of the uh, uh, the refunding that we did and the variable rate coming into here. So that's you know that that's in place here. Uh, we are going to start issuing the commercial paper uh, after after the September approval. If we keep the um, debt rate at 30 pennies, okay, we would see an early payoff of 11 million dollars. Okay, in comparison to a 28 penny, well, all these other numbers are the same. The only thing that's changing on the 28 pennies is this number here, this early payoff. So we'd be able to pay off seven million sooner, whenever we issue, whenever we issue money next, whenever we restructure debt next. And so what that would do is, by staying at the 30 pennies, we'd be able to realize 3.2 million in interest savings over the life of these maturities. Okay, so you know the the value of 3.2 million is basically the value of, of one penny, okay, in terms of you know the, what what a penny costs us. If we again, if we maintain that rate, we'd be able to have that savings. And so, 
Can I ask a clarifying question just Absolutely. for you? So you're saying we would pay off $11.1 million in debt early. Right. Plus realize a $3.2 million. Well, that's what would, that was what would help us. Otherwise, you don't get $7.5 Right. right. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. And so what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to maintain the flexibility going to the next summer, going into 2017 by maintaining our tax rate. You know, again, we made the recommendation to go down to 28 pennies before the, 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 uh, um, the litigation came through. And you know, that, the way things came down from a, uh, a Supreme Court decision really was surprising, especially uh, what, their, what their opinion was given everything else they said about the system. You know, so it's just, they, um, uh, they kind of took away a lot of our potential optimism for what would happen on the state side. And so if we're able to maintain the two penny rate, I mean th those two pennies, then that would take us into the tax swap, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So you've seen this slide before in terms of what the proposed rate would be at 28 pennies in comparison to 1516 and the impact to our taxpayers. Remember that, that percentage change for the average home value of uh, uh, would be just over eight, uh, eight percent. If we kept the thirty pennies, that value, that percentage change comes up to uh, just under nine. But the and the monthly impact is uh, three dollars and ninety three cents for the average home on a monthly basis because of the value growth. Of the value growth okay, and maintaining the thirty pennies. So that's the difference between the 28 pennies. I'm just full of transparency here. That's sure. the difference between the, the 28 pennies and the 30 pennies. But again, we'd be able to maintain. We'd be able to, uh, if we maintain the tax rate, we'd be able to pay off some of the debt early, saving 3.2 million. But then that would position us for a uh, uh, potential tax swap the next year, which is what this is talking about here. So next summer, Next summer could be an interesting summer. So what we would be proposing that if we if we would increase our M and O rate to a dollar six, keep bring the INS rate down to twenty eight pennies, we would have a net increase in revenue to the to the general fund of seven million dollars. So this is where the you know one of the few times that that your strategy for the debt service and and the M and O fund are overlapping. Usually they're just totally separate and we're looking at things totally separate. But this is where we would be we would be overlapping. So we don't have to make a decision on this part now. There's a lot to think about uh, going into the next time here. So these are the things that we're gonna that are gonna be on our mind before we come to you next spring saying, hey, we think we may want to do a tax swap which would initiate a tax ratification election. So again, you know, we had the litigation ruling. We'll have to see how the legislature reacts to that. But again, the state revenues are down. I showed you some of the information on the sales taxes. Um, they have publicly committed funding in, in some of the other priorities. Uh, just the initial outlook isn't encouraging. We are on the plus side. Uh, the resource allocation teams are, are, are busy. They're working. They're going to be working on program efficiencies to help us with uh, our budgets on the m and side. Uh, we will have uncertainty of local value growth. I mean, hopefully that'll continue you know, to maintain. I mean, <coughs> some of the signs are encouraging. I don't see us going, you know, going negative. You know, even with the uh, uh, with the oil going down, Fort Bend County is still growing. I mean, you can still see the the houses being sold. Um, so, but there is uncertainty there. Uh, we will have to absorb the costs associated with three campuses. We've talked about that. You know, the um, uh, so and we've allotted for that. We plan for that. But where we're at now in terms of thinking about our financials for next year is a potential deficit going into the 17-18 the budget planning of $9 million, which is before raises. But we know there will be a lot of pressure to do something from a compensation perspective given the, uh, just the, the small amount we've been able to do this year. So we, we have our work cut out for us, but we really need to try to maintain as much flexibility as possible going into the next year. So that's why our that's why our recommendation is, is to go ahead and maintain the, the rate at the, the 30 pennies. If we did that, so you know, our, our next steps at the, at the meeting on the 15th is when you, you call the date for the tax rate hearing. Uh, you do need to approve just the Chapter 41 selection. Uh, the, the approval of the supplement 
uh, we would be publicizing, again, the truth and taxation calculation. You have to publicize that. And then in September, you'd have the tax rate hearing and adoption. We'd bring in a uh, budget amendment to you as we spoke before, talked about the commercial paper. And then also just one of the things, uh, one, of th one of the technicalities, we will need approval of uh, a bond resolution to approve that the debt schedule for the potential early payment of debt. The way the truth and taxation calculations work, we have to have that in place because we can't assume moving forward that we're going to issue new money. Okay, in terms of, you know, that's just the rules when you do the truth and taxation calculation. We can't assume that we're going to issue new money. We know we're going to issue again. I mean, we have all of these major bond projects going on. We know that, but once we start all these projects and, and, and contracts that have been approved and these buildings start going up, that is going to cost us money. So we will have to issue. Uh, so what we have to do in order to uh, stay compliant with the truth and taxation publications is to actually take an action where you would prove the potential early payment of debt. But you, that w there will not be any specific transaction where that happens. You'll see that in the bond orders that we bring to you whenever we do issue new monies in the, in the future and how that uh, debt is structured at that time. So anyway, 15 slides. I'm sorry for the length, but I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. Do we have questions on this from the trustees? Mr. Burdeen. Comment. Thank you very much for all your hard work. We really appreciate it. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Bassett. We like saving money. We like hearing about ways we can save money. We appreciate that. All right. Review the uh, item F, review proposed fiscal and budgetary strategy for 1617. Do we have questions on this from the trustees? This is James. I have a question on this. It, uh, the new section that's been added is talking about um, delinquent receivables. And I know we've talked about that before, but this paragraph refers to some guidelines, written district guidelines. And I was wondering where those were housed. Are they on the website available to parents in the community or? What page uh, are we on, Ms. James? Sorry. Are we that's okay. I'm on page 74 of our total board book, which is page 5 of the fiscal and budgetary strategy. And it's the ad addition of the paragraph about collection of delinquent receivables. That, okay, so that... that isn't necessarily published the guidelines that we have I mean we've been working with the collection agency for the first time this uh, this past year you know based on what um, the fiscal policy changes we made last time to work on the, the collections but what we are doing is that we are making sure that we're that we're any of the the families that would owe this we are sending them letters on on, our, on an ongoing basis making sure they understand you know what's coming they're, they're not going to be hit out of the hit out of the blue or surprised by by anything if, if they do go to collections and so but those are just uh, those are just written procedures that we have in turn that's not something that we publish per se okay well I was wondering it, and maybe it's, it needs to be a different document or something but I guess what I'm trying to would like is to to have those guidelines or something published so people are, so it's clear what the expectations are or what the consequences are for failure to pay. And maybe it doesn't need to be, you know, the full, your district guidelines that you're going to use in your department. But it seems like we want to be kind of transparent. And as a person, say, just a regular person in my neighborhood, someone else in the neighborhood gets the letter and sometimes I end up in not, you know, not so much now, but in the past would end up as a resource for, as I say, go talk to somebody else, but I would end up as a resource for them. And so to be able to have the kind of what the deal is on the website seems to me to be helpful. 
but I don't know what other people think. Well, the way I would reference that is I, perhaps this is written district guidelines. Should that be procedure? Because our ultimate goal is to have all our procedures posted online, just like we have policy online today. So I think if we just simply edit to this to refer to it as district procedures and then write those procedures and house those online, then I think that would address that. But to just be on the short and sweet side, I mean, it's basically, you know, if, if you don't pay within, that, within 90 days, assuming you're getting uh, an update on that every month, then you know, then you will be sent to collections. But you know, we, we should have that in the procedures. We just haven't uh, quite gotten there yet. Okay. Well, I, th Dr. Dupree, what you suggest would, I think, changing the guidelines to procedures and then having the procedures available on the website, I think, would be great. Certainly amenable to that. Thank you. All right. We're on 6G, the proposed underwriters to be used by the district in connection with future bond debt. Do we have questions on this? 6H, we have several proposed resolutions. The first one is the district's investment strategy and authorization of investment brokers. Questions on this? Yeah, I, I have a question. Mr. Um, George. I see there are numerous <coughs> investment firms or broker dealers are mentioned here. What is the criteria? How do, how do we select them? Well, one, one of the ways, uh, yes, sir, one of the ways we select them is, is if, they're, if they're interested. I mean, we, we, get, we get solicitations from these folks asking to be, to be added to the list, same with the, with the underwriting firms. And so what we'll do is we, we see what they're, you know, what, what they're offering and if it's something that could match up. Uh, but we, we speak to them, we see if they're interested, we see what kind of ideas they have, how they might be able to help us. Okay, okay. So, so there is a selection process you go through. Yes. First of all, you see they are interested, then you, what do you look in them? Oh, when you select a company? Well, what we look for is, I mean, we look for creativity, we look for a track record, we want to make sure that they're, that, they're, that they're adding value. We don't want to necessarily have too, too long of a list because, you know, the, the folks that are helping us, we want to make sure they get business on a recurring sure. basis. Okay. But, but if somebody comes in that, that you know, is, is recommended, we'll talk to what's going on with some of our peers at other districts that are using them, if they're happy with sure. them, then, then we'll consider adding them to the list. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. George. All right, second resolution is authorizing Fort Bend to participate in the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance. Do we have questions on this? Hearing none, moving on to number three. Resolution authorizing Fort Bend to participate in the Region 19 Educational Service Center's Purchasing Cooperative. Do we have questions on this? All right, moving along. <laughs> They're leaving. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. We can, yeah. All right, we've got some proposed easements in six <laughs> I, a twenty-four foot wide easement, in the final uh, in the final plat for the new West Side Ag facility. Do we have questions on that? All right, the second easement, a ten foot wide electrical easement along the back side of Baines Middle School to Center Point Energy. Questions? Number three, signage and landscaping easement to Grand Vista Community Association for Elementary School 50. Questions? All right, 6J, uh, modification to the October 19th Fort Bend Independent School District selection of testing, adjusting, and balancing firm for the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning of two assigned projects. Do we have questions from the trustees on this one? Um, so, um, no, nope, don't. Ms. Helliger. Can someone just give me a, a brief explanation of this one real quick? Because we're, we're talking about 2015. Mr. Perez. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
my height there. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what occurred uh, here was that we uh, uh, issued both test and balance and commissioning to the same firm. And so basically you, you can't have the, the same one doing the commissioning as the test and balance because it's kind of like the fox watching the hen house. And so what we're coming back to you with is we're uh, looking at correcting that and bringing a different firm that was previously approved by the board as a, a firm that could provide these services uh, to go ahead and do so. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Okay, 6K, we have several purchases exceeding $50,000. The first one is learning A to Z. Mrs. James. Well, I'm just gonna share this question. You don't have to answer it, but I wrote. <laughs> How does this reach, this is just like a little conversation starter for our EG local conversation. How does this resource align with our curriculum development philosophy? Because I assume this was part of the uh, part of a resource uh, curriculum resource, so it just occurred to me if we had a development philosophy, then we would be able to know if this aligned or not. Thank you, Mrs. James. Always keeping us on our toes. All right, K two recess coaching services and related items. Mrs. James. <laughs> <laughs> Killing me, aren't you? Um, I just want to make sure this isn't structured recess. <laughs> that was the question I had. I'm pretty sure it's not because I know what <laughs> this is, but I just want to clarify. Oh, it's not, but we're going to ask uh, Stephanie Kellum to give us some specifics. I don't think you're on. Yeah, I don't think you're on. Um, it is not structured recess. It provides the kids much more opportunities to have multiple options to play with. So we're finding that there's reduced conflict, um, less bullying, um, less exclusion from activities with these services. So the kids have more opportunity to explore different activities and have the opportunity to have the skill set to be pr empowered socially and emotionally and physically. So. And what schools will we be implementing? These will be this? for the edge campuses. Edge campuses only? Correct. For now, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Mrs. James, you have another question? Well, I just want to say thank you, Ms. Kellum, because it's something I've heard about I'd heard about before and probably heard you speak about it, and I think it's a great idea. So I hope it is uh, proves to be as successful as, as uh, other s cases I've heard of and that we can spread it around the district. All right, K-3, Discovery Education, questions? K-4, Turn It In, which I am very familiar with, having two in high school now. Questions on this? I, I want to ask a question about the Discovery Education. Oh, I'm uh, moving I back. Yeah, I'm I know, you guys went now. really fast. <laughs> no, but no, my no, question no, about no, it is, because no, I didn't see where in here, um, again, this is a resource item, you made me think again of curriculum development, but are these uh, resources, what age levels, and are they available to parents? Especially since I saw Spanish language videos and things that looked very, uh, uh, you know, technology based. Um, I'll, I'll attempt to answer that. So these are resources that are, are used um, primarily secondary. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, let me correct myself. They're K-12 resources, but they're used uh, on campus primarily. So our teachers will ac access them uh, as supplemental resources. Um, they're videos that they'll use in the classroom. So these are the types of things that would be embedded in our curriculum. They are. They and are. they are embedded in our curriculum. So another reason to put EG Local at the top of the list. Thank you, Dr. Faust. Can I skip turn it in? Have you looked at those? <laughs> okay. Okay. Skyward. We all okay with Skyward? All right. Time and attendance system. Any questions? 
Number seven, identity management system. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Data center renovations. We're excited about the data center renovations. All right, WebSmart. <laughs> Facilities management software is number 10. Uh-oh, Mrs. James. <laughs> I, I can take the heckling. <laughs> There's always somebody. Okay, so my question on this is that it shows that this is coming. Is this the right one? Yep. Facilities uh, management software. Okay, never mind. I was on WebSmart. Did we uh oh, we, s we went past that. We blew yeah. past it. You yeah. said keep Send going. <laughs> now we're going backwards again. Okay, well, on the WebSmart one, it <laughs> says that it's come. Look, somebody loves me. Uh, it says that it's coming out of the general fund, and I wondered if that was accurate or if it really is coming. It really should be listed as coming out of child nutrition. Miss, Miss James, that's my mistake. That is, uh, that will be coming out of, gener uh, out of uh, child nutrition. Uh, there was 40-something items I was looking at. I apologize for that. No worries. I just want you to know I read them all. <laughs> Thank God. I think we could tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's different running the meetings than it is sitting over there. <laughs> all right, number 11, district electrical services. Number 12, HVAC <laughs> maintenance. <laughs> I'm shooting for 11, guys. I'm, I'm going. 13, painting services and related items. We'll adjourn before Mr. Rice gets back if we want to. <laughs> Number 14, district vehicles. Number 15, truck and tractor rentals. Oh, and number 11 is Mr. Rice. All right, I mean number L. Uh, 6L is to- I can ask some questions this whole time. Re no, we're good. <laughs> Review proposed and re review proposed audit committee's recommendation to engage Gibson Consulting. Do we have questions on this? Can we, talk, can we talk about this again? We did. It's just to actually engage them for the services that the audit committee uh, that are, are pursuant to the audit committee's plan for audits next year. It was a formality we needed to go through. Are there questions? I think we're good. All right, 6M, review the proposed endorsement of a candidate to represent Region 4 as a director on the TASB Board of Directors. We need to discuss this. Mr. Rice? Uh, I know George Ann Reitmeyer, who is uh, an immediate past president of the Gulf Coast Area Association of School Boards, and you all have probably met her at one of those re meetings at Region 4. So she's been very active uh, in this area, advocating for public education. She is currently serving on the uh, TASB Board of Directors with me and uh, seems very competent and very engaged. Unfortunately, I don't know the other lady from Crosby uh, so I, I can't make any comments about her. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Do we have additional comments by board members? Mrs. James. I, I know uh, George Ann as well and have worked with her on different things, but I do not know the other lady. And George Ann's been very pleasant to work with. All right. Thank you, Mrs. James. Anyone else? All right. Do, do, does the board feel comfortable endorsing George Ann Reitmeyer. Based on the recommendations of our fellow um, board members, I feel comfortable with that recommendation. Okay. That's how we'll move forward then. All right, review minutes of previous meetings. Do we have any comments or questions about the minutes? We have no audience response this evening which means I move that we adjourn <laughs> excellent we are adjourned at 1055 I beat 11 o'clock very good thank you guys it's good good